news tonight. Governing Council. The Taliban sets up a 12-member governing council to inquire into the country's needs. Severing ties. Algeria severs ties from Morocco due to the continuous dispute over the Western Sahara. Diplomatic tensions. Kamala Harris gives a risky warning to China over alleged intimidation over South China Sea. Fulfilling wishes. Mom raises funds for cancer research. Fulfilling late daughter's dying wish. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Danidu Vitanawasam. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a look into the situation in Afghanistan. After the stunning fall of Afghanistan, the Taliban is reportedly making efforts to form a 12-member council to govern the country. And with a week left until the Taliban's August 31st deadline for U.S. withdrawal, a top CIA official has met with the top Taliban leader, the first high-level meeting between the two sides. Ten days after the Taliban seized control of Afghanistan, the militant group says it's reportedly progressing with efforts to form a new government. Citing sources, a Russian media outlet explained Tuesday that it will include ex-Afghan President Hamid Karzai and the co-founder of Taliban in its 12-member governing council. It also reported that talks are underway to appoint the remaining five members of the council, although the Taliban has not yet commented officially. With a week left until the Taliban's August 31st deadline for completing a U.S. withdrawal from Kabul, a senior CIA official has reportedly met with the top Taliban leader in Afghanistan. According to multiple U.S. media outlets, William Burns traveled to Kabul on Monday, but no details have been disclosed yet on what was discussed. It's the highest level meeting held so far between the Biden administration and the Taliban since the group took over Afghanistan. Watchers say the most pressing issue is whether the U.S. airlift operation will continue beyond the August 31st deadline. Against the backdrop, G7 leaders met virtually Tuesday to discuss the crisis. Following the meeting, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said they agreed on a roadmap on how to engage with the Taliban going forward. What we've, we've done today at the G7 is we've, we've got together the, the leading Western powers and agreed uh, not just a uh, joint approach to dealing with the, the evacuation, uh, but also a roadmap for the way in which we're going to engage uh, with uh, the Taliban, as it probably will be a Taliban uh, government in, uh, in, uh, in Kabul. And the number one condition we're setting uh, as G7 is that they've got to guarantee right the way through, uh, through August the 31st and beyond, a safe passage, safe passage for those who, who want to, to come out. A number of G7 leaders expressed concerns over the timing of the August 31st deadline, but they failed to convince the Biden administration to give it more time. Over in the Southeast Asia, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris accused Beijing of coercion and intimidation to back unlawful claims in the South China Sea. Her most pointed comments on China during a visit to Southeast Asia, which she said was critical to U.S. security. In a strategic visit to Southeast Asia, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris had strong words for the Chinese Communist Party, which has clashed with a number of Southeast Asian countries over who controls parts of the South China Sea. Beijing's actions continue to undermine the rules-based order and threaten the sovereignty of nations. The United States stands with our allies and partners in the face of these threats. She then held a roundtable discussion with business leaders on how to secure a steady flow of products from Asia to the U.S. And on Monday, visited Singapore's Changi Naval Base and the USS Tulsa combat ship. But her trip is under shadow from the chaotic U.S. pullouts from Afghanistan, which China did not hesitate to point out meant that Washington cannot be trusted to secure peace within the Pacific region either. The trip is a seven-day-long visit to both Singapore and Vietnam, where Harris will meet high-level officials on Wednesday. According to an international study, climate change has made extreme rainfall events of the kind that sent lethal torrents of water hurtling throughout parts of Germany and Belgium last month. At least 20% more likely to happen in the region. 
rare natural disasters now increasingly frequent thanks to man-made climate change. July's devastating floods killed nearly 200 people in western Germany and nearly 40 in Belgium. Thousands in the Netherlands were forced to flee their homes. In a new report out Tuesday, the World Weather Attribution Group says both the severity and the increased likelihood of such events are inextricably linked to global warming and that nowhere will be immune. Even developed countries are not safe from the severe impacts of extreme weather. This is an urgent global challenge, and we need to step up to it. Spreading their analysis of weather records over a wide swath of Western Europe, researchers have calculated that floods like July's are now 20 to 800 percent more likely than before the Industrial Revolution. Greenhouse gas emissions have already added 1.2 degrees Celsius to global atmospheric temperatures. With warmer air holding more moisture, Europe's summer storms now bring 3 to 19 percent more rain. Scientists' capacity to trace the causes of severe weather events has become increasingly sophisticated. In 2021 alone, a severe drought in the western U.S., a brutal Canadian heat wave, and record Siberian wildfires have all been linked to rising global temperatures. Over to Japan now, some upsetting news for environmental activists and neighboring countries who have expressed discontent over Japan's decision to release wastewater from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. According to officials, Japan will press ahead with plans to discharge the nuclear water, wastewater into the sea just one kilometer off the coast. International outcry isn't stopping Japan from discharging wastewater into the Pacific Ocean. Nikkei Asia on Wednesday reported that Tokyo Electric Power Company, the operator of the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, will announce their decision to release treated wastewater into the ocean through an undersea tunnel just one kilometer off the coast. The report comes only months after the government announced in April that they'll dilute the wastewater below national standards ahead of releasing it into the sea within two years. Nikkei Asia added that TEPCO is aiming to survey appropriate areas of the seabed and submit the plan to the Nuclear Regulation Authority as early as next month for screening. The tunnel, used to release the water, is set to be completed by early 2023. Whether Japan should discharge radioactive water from the Fukushima plant has been a controversial issue for years. The facility has been storing some 1 million tons of treated wastewater since 2011, when a massive earthquake and tsunami destroyed reactors contaminating its cooling water. Japanese officials have long argued that releasing this water was the most realistic option they had. They even obtained an agreement from the International Atomic Energy Agency to monitor the process before the discharge. Regardless, local fishermen have been particularly concerned that the discharge would affect their livelihoods. In response, the Japanese government and TEPCO said the tunnel will minimize damage. They explained the water will go through a treatment process, where most of the radioactive material is removed. But the water will still contain tritium, which is only harmless in small amounts. Authorities added they will set up a fund to buy fisheries products and freeze them for temporary storage to make sure the discharge of wastewater doesn't cripple the fishery industry. Over in Eastern Europe, an exchange of letters between the Council of Europe and also Lithuanian head of state Ingrida Simioneta has actually exposed expanding stress over the supposed pushback of travellers on the EU's eastern borders. Lithuania and Poland have charged neighbours Belarus of sending out migrants as their means of revenge for EU permissions on Minsk adhering to the suppression of dissent. With large numbers of people crossing Europe's eastern borders with Belarus, concerns are being raised about Lithuania's streamlining of its asylum system, which can be used to reject asylum claims more quickly to send people back. The Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe, a body set up to protect fundamental rights, has written to the Lithuanian Prime Minister over concerns about amendments to their migration system, which she says remove in the case of an emergency situation significant safeguards in the asylum procedure, including in relation to the full examination of asylum claims, the provision of information and legal assistance, and the automatic suspensive effect of appeals against asylum decisions. 
Lithuania updated its laws at the beginning of August after President Lukashenko of neighboring Belarus said he would send migrants and drugs into the EU in response to sanctions imposed on his regime for cracking down on legitimate opposition protests. Lithuania says Belarus border guards have illegally entered their territory and pushed migrants onto their land. The country's prime minister insists the changes to their migration laws were adopted to speed up the application process and argues the mainly Iraqis who've arrived don't face persecution in Belarus. Responding in writing, Ingrida Simonite said to speed up final decisions on asylum applications, a mandatory pre-trial procedure for appeals against negative decisions has been introduced at the Migration Department. An effective judicial remedy remains fully guaranteed, she says. Meanwhile, though, Lithuania says a 500-kilometre fence it's constructing on its border with Belarus will be finished by September 2022. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Vietnam deployed soldiers to the street of Ho Chi Minh City to help enforce a strict lockdown in the country's biggest urban area and the current epicenter of its worst coronavirus outbreak up to date. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Mayuka De Silva reporting now from Hanoi in Vietnam. Yes, Dani. After managing to contain COVID-19 for much of last year, Vietnam has recorded a total of 348,000 infections and over 8,200 fatalities. Most of those cases have been recorded in Ho Chi Minh City and its surrounding industrial provinces, where the Delta variant of the virus has seen numbers soaring since late April. Vietnam implemented movement restrictions in Ho Chi Minh City in early July, but announced its harshest curves yet last week as infections have continued to surge. Authorities have said the enforcement of recent curves had not been sufficiently strict. Tighter lockdowns are now in places now prohibiting people from leaving their homes, even for food, and said the military would step in to help. The announcement triggered confusion and panic buy at supermarkets in the city. Just 1.8% of Vietnam's 98 million people have been fully vaccinated, one of the lowest rates in the region. Back to you, Dani. All right, thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Maika De Silva reporting from Hanoi in Vietnam. Authorities in the Islamist Hamas ruled Gaza Strip launched a lottery aimed at encouraging Palestinians to be vaccinated against the coronavirus with winnings of up to 3,000 US dollars. With an upsurge in Delta variant infections in the Gaza Strip, the enclave's Hamas authorities are trying to incentivize residents to get inoculated. From Wednesday, newly vaccinated over 55-year-olds can enter a lottery with the chance of winning the equivalent of over 2,500 euros, with three winners set to be announced a month from now. A daily draw will also see 10 newly vaccinated Gazans win smaller sums of money. So far, around 135,000 of the territory's 2 million inhabitants have received two vaccine doses. Many people are still hesitant about getting jabbed. So far, Gaza has received some 336,000 vaccine doses. Hamas authorities have also announced mandatory vaccinations for all civil servants, a measure already implemented in the occupied West Bank, which too has seen a surge in COVID-19 cases. The Gaza Strip has recorded more than 122,500 infections and over 1,100 deaths. Germany's gross domestic product rose by 1.6% in the second quarter, driven by private consumption, and the state pressed on with a huge debt finance stimulus push. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Inuka Aponsu reporting from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Tanidu. Consumers are helping to drive German growth higher. Figures show the country's economy expanding faster than initially estimated in the second quarter. Thanks largely to domestic consumer spending as the coronavirus lockdown was relaxed. GDP grew and adjusted 1.6% slightly up on the initial figure and a big upturn from the 2% contraction in the previous period. Private consumption was a big driver. Germans spent more and saved less as shops, bars and restaurants reopened. State spending also grew, but so did deficits. Over the first half of the year, public finances were in the red by almost 81 billion euros or about 95 billion dollars that equated to a public sector deficit 
of 4.7% of GDP, the largest in 26 years. The growth has helped Germany's economy emerge from an economic low that saw it contracting earlier in the year. Back to you, Danidu. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Inuka Aponso reporting from Cleve in Germany. Over in Western Africa, Algeria cut diplomatic relations with Morocco, citing what it called hostile actions by its most populous neighbor, with which it had strained relations for over a decade. The culmination of growing tensions between Algeria and Morocco. On Tuesday, Algiers formally severed diplomatic ties with Rabat. The two countries have long been at loggerheads over the disputed Western Sahara region of North Africa. At the end of 2020, Morocco normalized its relations with Israel, and as part of a diplomatic deal, the United States agreed to recognize Rabat's claim over Western Sahara. Algiers rejected the decision, declaring that it contradicted UN resolutions and would undermine de-escalation efforts between Algeria and Morocco. Algiers claims that Rabat backs separatist groups that seek independence for Algeria's Kabylie region, one of which it considers a terrorist organization and which it blamed for causing recent wildfires. The tensions between Algeria and Morocco date back decades. Diplomatic relations have already been severed once before, back in 1976, once again due to the dispute over Western Sahara. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Senegalese Justice Minister Malik Saar said that former Chadian President Hussein Habre, who was serving a life term in Senegal for war crimes and crimes against humanity, has reportedly died in custody. The UN's top human rights official is calling for a dedicated body to monitor the Taliban's action in Afghanistan. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet told the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva that she's received credible reports of the Taliban already seriously violating human rights, including executing civilians. Charlie Watts, popular within the rock music industry during his nearly 60-year career as a drummer with the Rolling Stones has died peacefully, surrounded by his family in a London hospital at the age of 80. Sydney's coronavirus infections soared to a pandemic high as officials urge people to get vaccinated and curb hospitalizations. Officials have warned that hospitals in the western suburbs of Sydney, the epicenter of the outbreak, are under pressure. New Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett arrived in Washington, D.C. for the first time as Prime Minister and plans to push for a new Iran strategy, saying he will urge the U.S. President Joe Biden not to revive the 2015 nuclear deal with Tehran. South Korea is likely to bar Google and Apple from requiring software developers to use their payment systems, effectively stopping them from charging commissions on in-app purchases and the first such curbs on the tech giants by a major economy. It's dubbed the anti-Google law. South Korea is expected to bar Alphabet's Google and Apple from charging software developers' commissions on in-app purchases. It would be the first such curb by a major economy and looks set to hurt the tech giants' lucrative revenue streams. The bill could be put to final vote on Wednesday. Lawmakers in South Korea started raising the issue of the tech giant's commission structure last year. Apple and Google have both faced global criticism. They require software developers using their app stores to use in-app payment systems that charge commissions of up to 30% on purchases. The European Union last year proposed its own Digital Markets Act, taking aim at such commissions. In South Korea, the home market of Android phone maker Samsung, the Google Play Store earned revenue of $5.29 billion in 2019. For Apple too, commissions from in-app purchases are a key part of its $53.8 billion service business and are a major expense for some app developers. And finally tonight, a mother who had never swum a full lap until recently is carrying on her late daughter's mission to raise money for cancer research by swimming as a fulfillment of her daughter's dying wish. When Vicky Bunky is getting ready for an open water swim, it doesn't come natural. I'm a little bit claustrophobic, maybe a lot claustrophobic, so I don't like to put my face in the water. The Georgia mom, until recently, had never swam a full lap, making this all the more remarkable. Her daughter Grace was the family athlete. But a cruel diagnosis at age 11 of osteosarcoma, a form of bone cancer, 
meant the amputation of her leg. Grace could still swim and join the cancer fundraising group Swim Across America until her condition worsened. When it was clear to the family she had little time left, Grace asked her mom to swim in her place. It was touching, but at the same time, it was a bit terrifying. She took lessons and just finished her eighth open water swim on the way to 14, Grace's age when she died. Raising thousands for research that might save others. Here you go. Not doing it alone. When I'm in the water, I do have a sense of peace. I think of Grace and I feel her presence. A life cut short as a legacy lives on. That is all from us here at World News. Susan and Shinali will be back tomorrow with a new edition. Until then, stay safe and protect your loved ones. I'm Danidu Tanwasan. Have a good night.